Who do Bill Gates, Reid Hoffman and Peter Thiel turn to when they need inspiration on talent? Tyler Cohen is one of the world's most influential economists. He specialises in talent. It is the one area that all business leaders wish they could improve in. Prime ministers and business leaders alike all read Tyler's blog, Marginal Revolution. Tyler Cohen's Marginal Revolution mm-hmm. is probably one of my uh, one of my favourites. His books include The Great Stagnation, Average is Over, The Complacent Class and Talent. Where do you find talent and what does talent look like in the 21st century? Tyler gave us some memorable insights. But I think the biggest part of interviewing is not how you interview, but rather which candidates do you attract. Which sectors he thinks the most ambitious people will head towards in the next two decades. Uh, Robotics is rising in status. Computational biology I see rising quite a bit. Why he is bullish on the UK. You have incredible soft power. You have two of the world's best universities. You have the world's best city, London. You have a perfect time zone. Why drinking Diet Coke might be a good predictor of talent. There's a nervous energy throughout the course of the day, which has to be expressed somehow, and they resort to Diet Coke. And why the future will be about AI teddy bears. And it will be able to teach your kid anything. So, oh, you have a four-year-old, you want the kid to learn Chinese, Uh, the AI teddy bear will be able to teach your kid. Tyler, welcome to Jimmy's Jobs of the Future. What was the first thing you did to earn money? I was a chess teacher when I was quite young. This will sound unusual, but I think I was 14 or 15 at the time. And I taught chess both to other young people and to adults. I was a kind of chess prodigy. And uh, actually earned a fair amount that way. People would come over the house or they'd pick me up and I would play chess games with them and instruct. Who was the most impactful person you met doing that job? Playing chess? I don't think it was about any single individual, but I learned two very important things early on. The first was A, I could win and win against adults. So that gave me a lot of confidence. But the second thing I learned was I could lose. And then you realize, you know, you're not so great and you have to be open to feedback or you're just going to keep on losing. So that's why chess was very good for me. And how did you improve playing chess at that age? Well, there there was no internet back then, of course. Mm. So at home, I would play through the games of the great masters. My favorite book was Alexander Kotov's Think Like a Grandmaster, which gave you a series of exercises similar to what people were doing in the Soviet school, which then was number one in chess. And I would periodically take the bus into New York City and play in chess tournaments against stronger players. And what do you think is the modern day equivalent of playing chess? Playing chess. Except you can do it on the internet, so all sorts of people do it including in India, China, everywhere else. And they learn these same two lessons, like A, you can win, and B, you can lose. And you don't really have excuses, not over the medium term. And what was your first job interview? Interview. Well, I worked in a supermarket called uh, Valley Fair. I think I was 16 then in the produce department wrapping uh, fruit. And I had a brief interview as to whether I could do the job, but I think mainly they hired me because my sister had already worked there and she was quite reliable. And maybe they thought that kind of thing runs in families and uh, they were maybe a bit desperate also. So they saw I was at least coherent and that was the interview. Yeah. Can you remember any of the questions or did they test you at all on how to pack fruit? No, they didn't test me. I think they just asked me, you know, do you want to work at this job? Will you show up? Uh, How old are you? It was like that, you know, not an actual interview of my quality. And what do you think employers are getting wrong when it comes to job interviews? Well, it really depends a great deal on the employer. A lot of interview processes are highly bureaucratized. They probably need to be just because you have a large company. For legal reasons, you need set procedures. You have to hire a large number of people. But if you're looking for individuals who are truly creative and you have the opportunity to actually talk to them, 
I think too many individuals and institutions are still using those same bureaucratized methods rather than actually trying to figure out what the person is like. But you need a good evaluator for that to work. You know, we know on average that doesn't work, but I think the point is you can be a better than average evaluator. And what's the best way to become a better than average evaluator? Well, practice helps, but I actually think most people are born with it. I think mm -hmm. there's a, you know, 2% or so of the population that is very good at evaluating the talent of other people. They may or may not end up in a job where they have a chance to do that and they need some practice, but they're just intuitively sharp and they pick up on a lot of cues. And if you're not in that two or whatever percent uh, to begin with, I'm not sure you can ever get there. How do you come up with a number 2%? Well, just from personal experience, I would say it is definitely unusual for someone to have that talent, but it's not that you meet it only two or three times in a lifetime. So uh, you see plenty of instances in all walks of life where institutions have such people. It's most visible, say, in areas like sports or music or entertainment, where you're actually like observing the production in some sense. And you see, say, you know, plenty of very good general managers or interviewers or people who run academic departments. So it's a small percent. Uh, but again, it's not a rare thing. You see it periodically on a reasonably regular basis. Google were known as being particularly innovative at the start of the century with the way that they asked questions and coming up with lots of different ones. That playbook has been copied by lots of firms now. Who do you think is the best at interviewing in 2024, which is now partly a Zoom world as well? Well, the Teal Fellows program has a very good record of picking winners. But I think the biggest part of interviewing is not how you interview, but rather which candidates do you attract. So it's what you've done before the interview to make yourself exciting so the good people want to come to you, be looking for you. And the same is true of Google. A lot of the questions they asked back then actually are not very robust or very relevant. But what Google did succeed in doing was establishing themselves as the exciting place to be for obvious reasons, and they attracted talent. And if you get talent coming to you, it's actually not that hard to be at least a pretty good interviewer. So that's, that's the part of the problem I would focus on. And how can a startup that say under a hundred people do that? Because it's perhaps easier when you're Google and you're hiring thousands of people, but when you're at those early stages, how do you improve that funnel towards you? Well, a lot of it depends where you are. If you're in the Bay area. I think using Twitter actually can work fairly well. Seem interesting on Twitter and build out your network and go to the right parties and just be in touch with the right people. Now, if you're in Northern England, uh, you cannot in any simple way do the same because the network simply isn't dense enough. Uh, but simply being out there repeatedly and with a clear message and some degree of charisma, I think is a good way to start. If you were a young, ambitious person, what is the way? I am a young, ambitious person. Let's say I go on. But it, okay, if you're, if you're under 25 and, and, and really wanting to kind of build a bit of that sort of social profile, as it were, whether it be on Twitter, et cetera, what's the best way of doing that? Like, how do you find a, a peer group that's so important? Well, be very good at something, right? And then... Try to be in touch with other people who are also very good at that something. They will be interested in you. So just think, like, who are your the three to five people you hang out with or maybe WhatsApp with who are smart, productive, and you learn from? And just keep on trying to better that group. I mean, basically for the rest of your life. And don't stop. And how much you'll succeed or fail, of course, that's an open question. But if you simply keep on trying at that, you have a big advantage over most people. And how, in a globalized world, how does that change things in terms of most people's peer groups come from school inevitably, but now it is possible to build connections with anyone around the world. How has that impacted talent and that sort of talent competition that you talk about? Well, if you work, say, on robotics, which right now is a hot area, but it's certainly not something most people are doing, uh, probably your peer group is not at your school. Maybe if you're at Waterloo in Canada, it might be, or a few other places, but it could be, you know, someone in India 
someone in the Bay Area. Who knows where the third person could be? So it becomes more important to have a very broad outreach as these new areas pop up. When have you misread talent, either sort of dismissed it or over-egged it? Well, most of the time you misread talent, right? So most investments fail, you could say, whether it's companies or people. Now, you know this in advance, so you're not convinced a person will succeed. You never should be. But most of the people you invest in don't end up making a huge difference for the world. So, you know, you have to accept that as the base case that you're going to fail and keep an open mind and try to learn something from it. Do we overcorrelate intelligence and talent? In my opinion, we do. Uh, on average, at least, I would prefer people who have a lot of determination, high integrity, and who are just willing to learn every day. Now, it, it depends on the skill. So if it's higher level mathematics, you know, IQ might be extremely important. But for most jobs, I would look for those other qualities first. And what are the other qualities that really demonstrate talent? Well, determination, willingness to work well with others, ability to work well with others, willingness to work on improving yourself, a high ethics and integrity. Again, the exact balance will depend on the job. If it's an auditor, you know, integrity probably rises in importance, but a lot of it's common sense, but smart people tend to overvalue people who are like they are. And that means they tend to overvalue intelligence. Do you think that one of the interesting things that I find now is that we have five generations in the workforce. Do you think it's been better over the decades to be blessed with different talents? Well, what do you mean by different talents? So I wonder whether intelligence was perhaps more important 40 years ago or a certain type of intelligence was more important. I think when you're in very new areas where things are just being formulated and maybe robotics again would be an example right now intelligence can matter more because you're just sorting out pieces not literally from nothing but at a, a pretty early stage and that will require more smarts and there aren't really these established systems for you to be working in where you need to be good at that uh, so insofar as an area is new i think that can be the case we should value intelligence a bit more and you know how it was 40 years ago well that's going to depend on the area but let's say 40 years ago what we then called junk bonds was fairly new uh and intelligence i think was in relative terms more important whereas now well these high yield securities it's about much more how do you work within an established system and cooperate with the other people yeah and the ability to do that across the globe as well um you talk about stamina being more important than grit or resilience. And I often think grit and resilience are sort of quite buzzwords in the startup scale-up space. But you distinguish that from stamina. Why is stamina important? Well, again, it will depend on the area, but I take stamina to mean a person who simply doesn't stop and doesn't get discouraged. I think of grit as how do you do in response to a setback? That's extremely important. But stamina is just, well, at age, whatever, are you still trying to improve yourself? Are you still trying to do your best? Are you still thinking the decade ahead of you, you know, can be your best decade? And the compound returns from learning, if you keep on learning, they're so high. There's some percentage of, you know, definitely older people who can just be extremely, extremely effective, but only if they have that stamina. How do you keep your stamina up? Well, I exercise every day. Uh, mentally, I'm quite active the whole day. I'm working with ideas or writing or podcasting. Uh, I think quite a bit of it is just innate and genetic, I suspect. Mm. Um, so, but you have, you know, it's like playing a sport. You have to work at it all the time or you lose it. Do you exercise first thing in the morning or later in the day? Later in the day, I like to save the morning for writing or maybe podcasting. And the ideal exercise time for me is between 3 to 5 p.m. When normally people might be a bit sleepy or your work quality declines. So then it's time to go outside and throw around a basketball. And what is the average Tyler Cohen morning routine? Wake up a bit before 7. 
check your messages, do some, but not all responding, and then get to work writing something, a book, a Bloomberg column, a blog post, just write, write, write every day, Saturday, Sunday, Christmas, your birthday, write every single day. The afternoon is then quite varied. It can involve meetings. It can involve Zoom calls, reading books, writing blog posts for the next day, whatever. And uh, just keep on working till about 11 at night and then go to bed with exercise in the middle. Obviously, one eats, talks to other people. How do you think the status of jobs has changed over the years? I have this sort of working theory that at the beginning of the century, lots of people, the brightest graduates wanted to be investment bankers. There was then sort of a move to consulting and the technology companies, as we were talking about with Google. And now it's a bit more on the creative entrepreneurship side, perhaps is what the sort of brightest people look to go and do. Is that something you agree with? Yeah, I think that's more of a fact than a theory. So I agree with you. Uh, right now, AI is quite high status, mm. but it's not easy for a lot of people to do. So you just can't say, oh, I'm going to do AI. Uh, there's a cognitive barrier there. That would be one area where very, very high intelligence is often extremely important in building the systems. Uh, but that's what I think is the most exciting thing to do right now. How do you think that the status of jobs and work might change over the next 20 years? I think AI will stay high status for quite a while. Uh, robotics is rising in status. Computational biology, I see rising quite a bit. So I think in the next 30 or 40 years, we're going to beat back most human maladies, and that will be astonishing. It's already attracting a lot of young talent, and I think that's only going to accelerate. It won't ever have the pay of some of these other areas, but my goodness, it's, it will be a wonderful thing to do and to have done. But all those areas, one of the things that strikes me as a bit of a contrast is that they all do require quite high intelligence, right? You, you can't do some of the things that you said there without being very clever. Well, I'm not sure clever is the word. I think AI requires you be in the top 1% of the top 1% in a way that, say, biology doesn't. Obviously, you have to be pretty smart to get, say, a PhD in biology. Uh, but past some point in that area, I'm not sure intelligence and success are going to be much correlated at all. I think it will be more about determination, wisdom, prudence, building a lab team, managing the people you work with, and other qualities like that. What do you mean by prudence in that? Well, knowing what's a foolish thing to do, what's not a foolish thing to do, hmm. what might be a fruitful research track, when you should fire someone from the team, uh, all that involves a lot of prudence. And that's not unrelated to intelligence, but often the very smartest people are, are far from perfect at making those kinds of decisions, I would say. One of the things that you talk about uh, in the book is climbing hierarchies and being able to see how to do that is a good predictor of talent. And I found that particularly interesting because it's almost understanding, in some regards, office politics, which has quite a negative perception when people talk about it. But I found that you focus in on that climbing social hierarchies quite a lot as an important um, indicator of somebody's talent. One of the most important factors, often the most important, so I meet a great number of people who are highly, highly intelligent and also not lazy but they direct their efforts toward climbing the wrong hierarchy. So when they're young, maybe they'll play computer games, which to be clear is fine, but they don't quite graduate from that. And they get caught up in small tasks or competitions where they don't really advance who they are and what they could be doing and who it is they'll meet. And the people who might be less smart or even work a bit less hard, but they're climbing the right hierarchy, uh, they tend to do better. So seeing how well someone can figure out like, where is it they need to be? Who is it they need to be allied with? And I like to ask that as an interview question in varying forms to see if they get it. Can you give us an example of how you would test for that then in a job interview? What kind of question would you ask? 
Well, here's a question I sometimes ask. I say, if you could, you know, have a two or three day retreat with three or four people of your choosing, and you'll just sit around for that weekend and talk with them, uh, who are the people you would pick who could best advance your career and teach you things? And it's not that I have a specific set of names in mind, but just to see how they think through that question. So one person I asked that question and the answer was, well, I would pick a number of people from parliament because I would want to tell them everything I know. Now that might be useful, like could be a good answer, but you also feel a bit, uh, that person's track for learning will be maybe a bit different than what you would have wanted. It wasn't, well, I'll pick some people from parliament and I'll learn how the British system of government really works. Uh, it's I'll tell them, you know, what to do. So some people will pick individuals who are too high up. So if you say, oh, I'd love the weekend with President Obama. Uh, again, that might be the right answer, but sometimes people are not understanding. You can often do better getting a job by networking with someone who's not at the very top of the company. So it depends more on the reasoning than the picks, but I find it's a very revealing question. Yeah, it's the attainable aspiration point. <clears throat> Who did you last have dinner with? My wife. Um, who did you last have a work dinner with? Let's see. I was at an event in Tucson and every dinner was a work dinner, basically with tables of eight. And that was just a few days ago. What have I done since then? Have I done any real socializing? Uh, daughter and grandkids. So. I think that's what you would expect. It's like full work mode or full family mode. And like my social life is my work life. I'm not just like, oh, I'm going to go out with the buddies and we're going to have a few beers and shoot the breeze. Like, I just don't do that. Uh, maybe that's a defect in my life, but for me, it's less fun. I'd rather mix like the dinner with some work related purpose or just have it be family. What's the secret to hosting a good dinner? Well, not even the secret, but what in your mind works well to hosting a good work dinner? Well, I don't know that I host them per se, but I think not having any person there who is going to wreck the mood or the pace. So the quality of the worst person there is quite important because people will defer a bit to trying to include everyone. And that's nice and polite, but it often lowers the quality of the conversation. So to be a little ruthless and just insist that everyone there contribute in a particular way, uh, I think is the right way to do it. Do you think it works getting people to provide materials in advance or answer a question in advance? I don't think it matters that much. Uh, the people you want there you hope have thought about the questions anyway. I think it's fine to do that in advance, but it's probably not a difference maker. It's more about who it is you're inviting. If Tyler Cohen were 24 today, who would he want to be hosting at that retreat? Well, it depends who it is I already know, uh, but tech CEOs, you know, someone like a Patrick Collison would be on my list or a Peter Thiel. He's not a CEO, but he runs venture capital, uh, Eric Schmidt, people like that. Um, it's really interesting. You have, have but there are people I know now. So again, it depends on exactly what's the counterfactual. But uh, yeah, that's what I'm trying to think. I, I suppose it, if, if you were 24 today, I mean, you meet a lot of young people who apply um, for emergent ventures and so on. I'm, I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm fascinated by sort of, you know, the kind of rising stars element and just who you've seen in that age that would, that you'd want to, to spend time with. Oh, you mean other 24 year olds? Yeah, I get, yeah, around that age. Well, I know a lot of them. They're the emergent ventures winners. There's now over 500 of them. I find them quite impressive as a group. Uh, I would say in particular, I think biology is a strong area now, but all over, uh, even, you know, people doing podcasting like Dwarkish Patel would be an example.
He's yeah. one of the best podcasters. I think he's tw actually literally 24 or close to it. And I, I, I mean, I hang out with him now, but if I were 24, I would still hang out with him. Uh, yeah, he's, he's an amazing podcaster. I've listened to, to you on his, uh, on his show and it's, uh, I even listened to some of the old episodes and what's really interesting is just how much better of a host he's become over the, uh, the years. Um, and that's this idea of working on self-improvement, which he's great at. Yeah. And you talk about, you practice basketball every day, even though that's not a strength. Why is that? I like to get outside. It's good exercise. There's a lovely park right near where I live, but I think it's also useful to do some things you're not great at just to keep your humility. Like I've been shooting baskets since I was eight years old. It's a long time and I'm still not really good at it. Like I'm better than most people, but it's clear to me, I'll put up a stupid shot like a quarter of the time, you know, even after basically 55 years, like, how can that be? What kind of idiot am I? But you also realize you're that kind of idiot approaching a lot of other problems as well. And you don't have even the 55 years of practice. One of the things that you know to note in the book with Daniel Gross is how one of the things that successful tech entrepreneurs in particular have in common is that they all drink Diet Coke. What's the logic behind this? That's more Daniel's hypothesis than mine. I don't disagree with him. Uh, he knows more tech entrepreneurs than I do. But I think the notion that there's a nervous energy throughout the course of the day, which has to be expressed somehow, people don't much smoke anymore, which is for the better. And they resort to Diet Coke, I think is his reasoning. Um, do you think, as a young person, coming from a background where you don't have many connections and you're starting out, do you think it's easier to make it in the modern world or is it harder? And I'm framing that in the sense of 30, 40 years ago, there were less career opportunities available. So it was perhaps easier to get in one of them and then follow a kind of hierarchy. Whereas now the world seems so much more fragmented and there's so much more opportunity that there's almost a paralysis of choice. There might be a paralysis of choice, but I think overall it's much more meritocratic. And if you just look at say women or minorities, which is combined more than half the population, their opportunities are much, much better than in earlier decades, really much better. But even putting that aside, if you just look at like stereotypical Western white men, you have different ways of proving yourself. If you think as a kid, well, I'd love to write for the New York Times, there are just more paths to get there. So someone like Ezra Klein, who just like was a kid in Irvine, didn't go to a great school, didn't even do that well in college. And he writes in podcasts for the New York Times. And that could not have happened, say, in the 1980s. You give a really interesting example in the book of Taylor Swift and how she was able to have quite sort of location to Nashville and her parents came from a financial background. Do you think there's the chance that we'll see more Taylor Swifts in the modern world now because it's easier to move location, etc.? I think parents are becoming even more important. So that's, it's not a good thing for everyone because we have so many single parent families, but since you can learn so much so young from the internet and from AI, the question, do your parents encourage you? Taylor Swift would be music, but almost any area, it's just really quite central. And that's going to disadvantage a lot of groups of people, but the, those with, with great parents can do so, so, so much better. And that's still a lot of people. I would say it's most people, but it's a strongly differential effect. On the other side of the ledger with that is you get a lot of US presidents and a lot of UK prime ministers actually that lose a parent before the age of 30. How do you think that impacts people and their aspirations? Well, I think about the Beatles, both Paul McCartney and John Lennon lost their mothers as I think young teens. 
And that obviously was extremely hurtful. And it seems they had had very good mothers, uh, but it gave them some kind of drive or wanting to put the hurt back together again or, or confront what happened. And it gave them this emotional richness at quite young ages. And I don't think the Beatles could have been the Beatles. It also brought Paul and John together emotionally. Uh, so it's a terrible, tragic thing. Uh, but some people do take that and, and turn it into something that makes them more productive and more creative. How do you balance scale with equality? You obviously try and speak to lots of people and you go on lots of podcasts and you do a lot of promotion. But at the same time, you also want to make sure that the applicants that apply to Emergent Ventures and, and anyone that emails you is of a certain quality and standard so you're not overwhelmed. How do you balance scale with quality? Well, for Emergent Ventures, we don't advertise at all. So if every day a thousand applications came in, uh, that just wouldn't be workable for my inbox, among a number of other reasons. So keeping things secret is very important. I mean, secret's not the word. There's nothing hidden about it. There's just no publicity. And a lot of our best winners come in through other winners, which I think is how it should be. Mm. And we've expanded geographically. So now we do quite a bit in Africa and in India, also in Ukraine. Uh, and that's gone very well. I have two people who helped me with it. They're both great. And so far, so good. How did you choose those two people to help you with it? Well, Shruti Rajagopalan does Emergent Ventures India. And I've known her. Oh, I met her in India, 2004, actually. She ended up getting a PhD at my university and I've known her a long time and just knew she would have good judgment. She's part of that 2%. And then we had an early winner uh, named Rashid Griffith from Barbados. He does Emergent Ventures Africa and the Caribbean. And I just had the intuitive sense he'd be great at that. And he has been. So there's the three of us. Uh, I still do more of it than the other two, but they do really quite a bit. And look, India, Africa, the Caribbean, those are big areas and we get a lot of applications from them. Yeah. And do you think with those areas that, um, the funding can go further and have greater impact than somebody from Western Europe or the United States? Well, you mentioned Western Europe. We hardly get applications from Western Europe. And I find this interesting, although people are well-educated and have good English. We have more winners, you know, say from the UK or for that matter, Ireland than all of Western Europe put together. So the language, the Anglo world as a thing really still matters more than I would have thought. Uh, India in particular has been a fruitful area for talent. There's just enough internet access, just enough English, a lot of aspiration and ambition. And I think India as a talent pool is, you know, along with North America is really number one today in the world without question. Th that is, um, it's really interesting. On, I wanted to ask you a bit, a bit about the UK. That's obviously predominantly where a lot of our audience is, is, is based. You're very bullish on the UK and particularly the southeast of England. Can you explain why? You have incredible soft power. You have two of the world's best universities. You have the world's best city, London. You have a perfect time zone. You're between North America and the European Union. Uh, like most countries, you're your own worst enemy, but you still innovate to an amazing degree. And there's all sorts of problems, uh, but I would be, you know, long most of the UK, not every geographic part of it, but I think as an influence on the world per capita, you will remain one of, you know, the top five countries for the foreseeable future. How do you think the UK could raise its ambitions? And you talk about this in the book as well, about how to go about doing it with individuals and it can be one of the most impactful things that you can do is make a suggestion to someone that they be more ambitious. And sometimes that can be the first thing that can be one of the most important things that you can do. It's quite just a are speaking. We planned this before, but as UK elections been called and I get a lot of people at the moment messaging me with my background saying, are you going to stand, et cetera. 
And actually, one of the things that I'm trying to do desperately is go back and be like, actually, why don't you stand? Why don't you think about it? Um, and it's just... I'll stand. Yeah, exactly. I'd, yeah, I'd vote for that. Um, but just how, how can a country do it? But also, the, the follow-up question is, is, how can individuals go about going around and doing that? Because that's what I see the whole point of this podcast and everything that I try and do is to encourage people to be more ambitious in their careers. Well, I'm in the UK reasonably often. Obviously, there's selection with whom I'm speaking. But even given that, I get the sense there are just a lot of negative attitudes in the country, most of all about yourselves. And I don't think that's helpful. And uh, the self-confidence of earlier times seems to be gone. And getting some of that back, I think, would be very useful. And then entrepreneurship needs to have higher status. So there's still a kind of class system in, in many parts of English life that maybe isn't useful for that. And people don't quite think they're going to have to work as hard as they actually will have to work because they're sort of smarter and more articulate and better read, or they went to great schools. And in some ways, those things are negatives. They're not like net negatives, but they hold some parts of your entrepreneurship back. Whereas Americans mm -hmm. sort of assume they're born stupid in a way, and maybe they are. And we grow up surrounded by so many stupid things. You feel you never have to stop clawing your way into like greater smartness. And like British, you know, people from South of England, they are just better read and smarter and more articulate, uh, but they take it for granted in a funny counterproductive way. Yeah. It's not wanting to show it as much in the UK. I, I had this theory with UK entrepreneurs that they either tend to come from the sort of upper classes for want of a better phrase or the working classes and it becomes a part of the sort of the former can afford to take the risk and the latter have no risk so therefore they find themselves in entrepreneurship there's a real sort of you know a lot of successful uk entrepreneurs kind of fall into one of those two buckets i find yeah and over time i suspect south asian immigrants and other immigrants will fix some of these problems for you that would be one reason to be optimistic. Your rate of immigration, like it has created problems, I get that, but it will have this long run benefit of breaking down class distinctions. You're just gonna have so many wealthy people, you do already, a PM for that matter, who's also wealthy, who don't fit into the traditional distinctions of the class system. Yeah. What do you, how do you perceive Brexit in that regard? When Brexit happened, I was against it. I still feel it was an imprudent decision, but as time has passed, I've come to see it as inevitable. And it's just a question of having to make the best of it. You all just are very different from the continent. And yes, there was a reformation and, uh, that difference is something you can embrace. So I don't sit around like moaning, oh, let's have another referendum. Next time Remain can win, we can what, go back. I just don't think so. I think it will end up working out, but you probably took a 2 to 3% hit to GDP and had a lot of political years in the wilderness trying to figure out a lot of kind of stupid issues that actually distracted you from your main actual problems. Yeah, I also think it's made some of our most successful people feel quite negative about the UK and themselves. And... It's interesting on an immigration point because actually immigration and the talent coming into the country has changed quite a lot. Actually, the numbers have remained quite similar, but instead of coming from the European Union, now they're coming from the rest of the world. And I, I wonder about what will be the impacts of that in sort of 20, 30 years time. And the rest of the world is a big category. So yes. I think it depends where they come from. There's particular points of time. When some countries are great sources, like Nigeria right now is producing a lot of talent, may not have been true in earlier decades. Uh, so I think overall, I mean, I know the last few years, there's been a lot of weird changes in who's coming to Britain, but the, the broader, longer run trends, I think are pretty positive for who's coming to your country. And do you think there's a danger that the UK and, and the rest of the West of Europe becomes almost the former developed world? in this century? Well, that's happening already. So when you say danger, 
I think the differences in the UK and most places will increase as the world and the globe becomes more meritocratic. That will clash with a lot of your egalitarian instincts. So you'll have to do things like make it easier for people to privately say, buy their own medical care. Mm. Uh, those will be tough battles, but you know, we'll all, we're all going to muddle through one way or another. That's and true. there's something about British national spirit. People feel the need to give reasons for what they do. And in America, they don't, they just do things, which in a way is a good thing, but you all strike me as so reasonable. And I think that repeatedly saves you all from these huge mistakes. And like us, you're going to muddle through and reemerge on the other end. Again, still is one of the top five or so nations per capita for creativity, innovation, importance. Yeah. Maybe we're just going for our Man United phase where we're not quite as good as we were, but we'll still be in and around the top. And you, you're quite sort of skeptical in a recent interview you gave with the generalist, you were quite sort of skeptical on Germany. And that I was fascinated by that because we often, particularly in UK public policy debate, hold up Germany as a great example of where we should be looking to head towards, particularly in business with the middle stand and so on. But why are you a bit more down on Germany? Well, I think in the short run, they're just very badly screwed. Long run, I definitely think they'll bounce back as they've bounced back from much worse situations, like take after World War II, right? Whole country was bombed out. But if you look at their energy policy, or if you look at how China is going to pick apart a lot of their best producers on the value chain, how their exports to China are going to decline as China builds up its own, you know, Mittelstand, uh, their unwillingness to invest in their own infrastructure, the declining quality of their primary education system, and just their sort of sloth and complacency. It's amazing how they've blown, say, what they had 20 years ago. It's hard to think of a bigger decline. Again, I, I'm pretty confident about the longer run, but they're in a very bad situation. And the notion that like France is in much better shape than Germany, people would not have expected 20 years ago, but it's clearly true. What do you think France is getting right at the moment? Artificial intelligence. They've become a European leader. Uh, Macron, whatever you think of the particulars, he's just not crazy. And to have a leader who's not crazy is worth more and more. The quality of their elite is high. Amazing civil service. I think most countries are going to have to make a lot of big, important decisions. And they seem pretty well positioned to do that in a quality, non-crazy way. Tourism demand there is eternal. Uh, they have a pretty high degree of security in terms of where they're located and having nuclear weapons. I'm pretty optimistic about France. They're not going to grow 4% a year, but I think people dismiss them unfairly because they're sort of not American enough or the old joke, oh, there's no word for entrepreneurship and French and so on. I think they're doing pretty well. It's interesting because I don't, I agree with a lot of what you're saying there, but I don't think the UK public policy debate has actually caught up with that much at the moment. There's more that we're more hold Germany up in higher regard than we do France in terms of a model. But I agree with you. I think, I think it's shifting, um, but there's sort of. And they're willing to build a lot of homes and have proper mass transit, like two big things. They pretty much get right. And building homes, UK is a mess on. It's terrible. Oh, yeah. And I think the Conservative Party may end up feeling the impacts of that over the uh, next uh, few weeks. What, um, what, what other countries in the world do you think are growing rapidly, where you're seeing lots of talent come out of? I mean, you, you, you've talked about Nigeria and the rest of Africa and the Caribbean with the emerging ventures. But wh where else and what sort of specific countries do you think are doing are interesting to look at. Well, I've already mentioned India. In terms of talent, I think Ireland is underrated. Mm -hmm. People dismiss it either because it's small or, you know, sometimes people from the UK will look down on it. Uh, but I think they're going to do very well. I would say Poland is a country. It's been growing great. Uh, maybe not a big source of innovation, but I'm pretty bullish on their future. Uh, Czechia also. The parts of Eastern Europe that still hate Russia, I would be bullish on. 
what what do you think the impact of the Collison brothers could be on Ireland in that regards? And, and just unpack a bit of why you're ambitious on Ireland. Well, the Collison brothers are a huge role model for young Irish entrepreneurs. And when they first came along, I thought, well, like there's some weird outlier, but I actually now think, well, they're the first wave. And that's a very different perspective. So especially Irish, not from Dublin, who are upstarts, even within Ireland, it's not a traditional class system in Ireland. Ireland attaches mentally, psychologically more readily to North America than the UK does, mm. partly for reasons of migration, but partly in some ways, Dublin not quite being an intellectual center, you know, at the scale of London. So, you know, they're in the EU, English language, great time zone, a highly educated society, most educated in the world. Think they're just going to do well keep on doing well i would like to just ask a few questions on ai um i would love your thoughts on on how ai will impact talent i realize that is an enormous question but what are your sort of top line thoughts on, on how ai will impact talent over the next 10 years it's very hard to make ai predictions but i think Parents will have the option of giving their kids what I call the AI teddy bear. And it will be able to teach your kid anything, almost anything, if the kid wants to learn. So, oh, you have a four-year-old, you want the kid to learn Chinese or a certain kind of mathematics or chess, whatever. Uh, the AI teddy bear will be able to teach your kid. Now, a lot of parents just won't do this. They'll think it's bad for the kid or weird. The kid talks to the AI teddy bear more than to the parents, but you're going to have so many young people who are just going to be so, so, so smart and well-educated early on. And I think it's going to revolutionize many things. It just raises that starting point, doesn't it? For people's careers, essentially. Do you, do you think it, it will lead to a new sort of Renaissance period? Well, I think we're already at an incredible period mm. for ideas and innovation. So I would, you know, consider AI. We now have stuff that in many areas is at least as smart as humans, which was not expected. It's not just chess anymore. And then we are just curing things. There's an anti-malaria vaccine. Uh, we're probably going to beat back dengue. There's serious talk of some of the anti-cancer vaccines working. Again, most maladies in 40 years will not be a thing if you have reasonable income and live in a decent country. So, uh, my goodness, what two achievements for an era to have. Mm, that's extraordinary. And the, you... the Brits, you know, you all had a vaccine against COVID. It was sort of, you could say, invented in a day. It's a little unfair because you needed 20 years of earlier work. But you and then we just came up with the vaccine. I mean, that's amazing. And it worked. Yeah. So, you know, people should be more optimistic in the UK. I agree. Have you played with, um, you know, one of the things that you try and do is speak to as many interesting people and impart as much wisdom and knowledge as you have. Have you attempted to make a, a Tyler teddy bear as of yet, as it were? There are about five Tyler bots out there made by other people of varying quality. Uh, I spoke to some people who work in the companies and they say, just wait for the next generation of models. You won't need to make a special bot. It will just embody you if you wanted to. So it's coming. Uh, I, I'm not sure I need to make it. You know, I did embed one of my books in a GPT-4 model mm -hmm. and you can interrogate the AI about the book, ask for summaries or criticisms of what I wrote. So that's a partial attempt in that direction. Henry Oliver, who came on this uh, show about a month ago, who's written a book on late bloomers, who was part of the Emergent Ventures grant, also did that as well for his book. And it is, um, it's fascinating how you could extend the learning um, from a book by being able to do that and revisit it and so on. I think it's really interesting. It's a, it's a, great, uh, a great book. Um, I agree. It's a great book. I think we need the AI service for these long fantasy novels where you put the book down and you've forgotten the names of half the characters and you should just be able to ask the bot, like, 
who, who's Aragorn, you know, son of Thedor, or, and it will tell you because right now you're just stuck with, oh, am I going to go back and start from page one again? I'm so glad you say that, Tyler, because I find myself sort of folding over the pages early on in the book thinking I'm going to need to come back to reread the introduction <laughs> to this person. But I'm, I'm glad that uh, problem uh, occurs to you as well. Um, the We have a great show here in the United Kingdom uh, called Desert Island Discs, and uh, people get to pick their favourite tracks uh, that they want to take away with them. But they're also given a luxury that they can take on the island with them. Um, it can't be something that you can use to help uh, escape or have any practical use. What, what would your luxury be? Well, can I take a music player? Yeah. I would need a su supply of music, but it would be that, clearly. Beethoven, Bach, Mozart, right? That would keep me busy for a long time. And if you could only take one track, which one would you take? I don't know. It might be better not to take any because you would ruin that track by playing it too much and you would destroy its memory. And I think you'd be better off with no music at all in that case. That, that is very interesting. You're also allowed, to, you're given the Bible and the works of Shakespeare, but you can also take a book with you as well. Which book would you take? Well, you want a long book, maybe Proust in search of lost time, right? That too will keep you busy. And I would bring it in German, which I read much more slowly than English. That's interesting. What other languages can you speak? German, Spanish, English, to varying degrees. Which do you prefer, German or Spanish? Uh, I'm better at German, but Spanish is more useful. Yeah. Uh, that's interesting. Is there somebody who's been a particularly influential mentor in your life? Well, one should always say one spouse, right? True. Uh -huh. But, you know, when I was younger, there was a fellow named Walter Grinder I met, and he just had the ambition of reading all these books. And that just showed me that could be a plausible ambition. So that was a big influence on me. How did you meet your spouse? Match.com, 21 years ago. We were early adopters. Oh, right. I was going to ask whether it was a sliding doors moment, but... Probably not. Well, it was a sliding doors moment. You know, I signed up for the service and like an idiot, I used my real name as my screen name and I emailed her and she had stopped subscribing to the service and thought she would write me back, but didn't have access to the messaging system because she had stopped paying. But because like an idiot, my screen name was my real name. She was able to track me down and emailed me back outside of the system. So it could have very easily not happened. Oh, wow. That's um, pretty re remarkable. Um, do you ever th think about how life might have been different? Well, sure. I mean, life uh, would be very different, but you don't know what else would have happened. I don't think there's much of a chance I would have met her. Like there's some couples, well, you sort of knew they were going to meet all along, right? They both yeah. went to Harvard in the same year or whatever. Uh, but this is not one of those. I lived in Virginia. She lived in Maryland. Uh, how uh, I think internet dating is fascinating. It obviously, become much more kind of prevalent in the last sort of decades in terms of talent matching, and it just does. It it sort of throws up a lot of the cards. Like previously, you'd sort of talk about people likely to meet each other at university, etc. But it I, I do find it fascinating. the The other impact is that when I started work in the late noughties, none of this existed. And so you went out with your work colleagues a lot more kind of in the evenings. And actually now it's, it's much more possible to sit at your desk and kind of set up a date for that evening, which means that actually that sort of culture and that bonding doesn't happen um, as much in the workforce. Um, there's pros and cons to that side of it. But I do think it's something that um, employers are struggling with at the moment in terms of matching that that cultural aspect and kind of making that happen in companies. What are your thoughts on that? Well, many people tell me internet dating has become much worse. I can't mm. say myself, uh, but earlier on, there was actually a huge stock of marriageable people in the system. The problem is they all married off. Yeah. And now there's, you hear a lot about a kind of cycling 
you know, with Tinder and you keep on swiping and there's maybe too much choice and you always feel there's someone better and different men can just like become players more easily. I, I'm not speaking from this firsthand, but possibly it's a worse system than it had been. How do you think this interview has gone? It's been a lot of fun. I've enjoyed it as well. Conversations with Tyler is a great podcast. If somebody's come across you in this interview for the first time and wants to consume more audio content from you, what's a good episode to start with that's a jumping off point? Well, I always like to say the next episode. Uh, but Catherine Rundell, who is from your Oxford, I did an interview with her on uh, John Donne and British Poets, but just about life in general. And she was a marvelous, incredibly engaging person to have on a podcast. And you should have her on too. That's Rundell, R-U-N-D-E-L-L. Yeah, we will absolutely do that. That's one of our other questions is to pass the mic as well. So uh, you've, you've answered two in one. Uh, Tyler, thanks so much for coming on Jimmy's Jobs of the Future. It's been a real pleasure. I am trying to do so much of what you're doing in terms of raising the ambition of people and inspiring people on their kind of careers with all the different jobs out there. It's been, uh, it's been a really enjoyable and informative hour. So thank you very much for spending it with us. Thank you, Jimmy. It's been great chatting.